You're listening to Skills World Live with Tom Buick. News, views and interviews in association with FE News. Hello, I'm Tom Buick. Welcome to another informative episode of Skills World Live. And in a week when the government finally published the list of qualifications eligible for the Lifetime Skills Guarantee, only two months late, of course, we found out more about the small print this week. Yes, for those millions of adults without a first level three qualification, the government is making available. Out of only 379 courses approved, up to 10 different types of physics A-level. Meanwhile, if you've been made redundant in hospitality, retail or aviation due to the pandemic, you can forget about using your so-called free entitlement to retrain in recreation, fitness, creative industries or animal care. Those courses have not made the final grade or passed the Prime Minister's We Know Best Skills Advisors in the number 10 policy unit. No bother, at least those science A-level choices might come in handy, particularly if you decide to emulate the cast of Breaking Bad and set yourself up in business as a crystal meth lab. Yeah, talking of advances in drugs, at least we had more positive news this week as the first human beings lined up in Britain to receive the clinically approved coronavirus vaccine jabs. 91-year-old Margaret Keenan shot to global fame as the first recipient receiving the Pfizer vaccine, as it happens in the same Coventry University Hospital where I was born far too many years ago. And uh, staying in the beautiful county of Warwickshire, who would have thought 404 years after the great bard's death that one Mr William Shakespeare would pop up this week as the first man in the world to officially receive the COVID-19 vaccine. It has a whole new meaning to the phrase, to jab or not to jab, that is the question. You're listening to the Skills World Live radio show with Tom Buick. Tonight's show is all about the state of diversity in the world of FE. And what does the sector need to do to boost more equality, diversity and inclusion? It's also the week when the Virtual Music of Black Origin or MOBO Awards took place. I see that Rapper Nines and the R&B singer Mahalia were big winners. So many congratulations to them. I'm dedicating all of tonight's tracks to the black artists that have influenced my musical tastes and record collections over the years. Starting with this classic from Michael Jackson and Beat It. So 
Do you need to gain off-call recognition? Does your current IT solution meet new regulatory arrangements and ways of working? Are you wrestling with managing cost and resources while still delivering a high-quality endpoint assessment experience? At Creatio, we can help. We've got more companies through the recognition process than anyone else. Our solution underpins all aspects of a qualifications lifecycle, from development to delivery and assessments to awarding. It's used by more regulators organizations than any other system get in touch at creatio.org.uk today coming up on the program shortly i'll be talking in a four-way discussion with robin lamman one of the founders of the black fe leadership group and uh, calvin robinson a think tank researcher and social commentator and of course one of skills world live's favorite former apprentices shola west she's coming up on the show of course uh, she works at that tech startup founded by ewan blair at uh, White Hat. But first, let's find out what's been making the news headlines in your skills world this week. The Department for Education in England has revealed the Level 3 courses it will be approving for adult funding support when the Lifetime Skills Guarantee programme rolls out from next April. First Level 3 courses have been available for free to students under the age of 23 since 2013. The government says the approved qualifications reflect what is valued by employers and will help individuals retrain for new careers. But some sector leaders have been critical of the less than 400 courses approved, pointing out that many important sectors of the economy have been missed off. The boss of the Association of Employment and Learning Providers, Jane Hickey, said she was disappointed that the hospitality and retail sectors had been left out. A government spokesperson told FE News that awarding organisations and mayoral combined authorities will be able to add to the approved list where they can provide evidence the courses will be valued by industry. In other news, the Association of Colleges published a report this week claiming that competition in the sector was having a negative effect on learner choice and course quality. The report calls for the establishment of a single post-16 commissioning and regulatory process, including a legal requirement on FE providers to collaborate in the local economy. The AOC boss David Hughes denied the plans meant less autonomy for college principals arguing that a placed-based managed market was what was actually being proposed. And finally, the Hampshire-based Andover College has found a solution for the annual pantomime this year. Theatrical learners in the Performing Arts Department have teamed up with students studying digital media to produce a Covid-secure live stream of the Christmas favourite, Beauty and the Beast. The panto is being made available on YouTube so that the whole student and local community can tune in. Contact us at Skills World Live. We want to hear from you. Email skillsworld at fenews.co.uk. Follow us on Twitter at Skills World Live at Tom Buick. Use the hashtag Skills World Live. Call us on 02032 900 111. That's 02032 900 111. Welcome back to Skills World Live. In this episode, we'll be looking at the issue of diversity in Britain's further education sector and what can and should be done to improve black and minority ethnic representation across the education world. To talk to me about this important topic, I'm joined on the line by Robin Lamman OBE, one of the co-founders of the Black FE Leadership Group. Calvin Robinson, who is a senior fellow at the Policy Exchange Think Tank and a social commentator. And finally, Shola West, the co-founder of Youth Unlocked and a former digital marketing apprentice with the award-winning tech startup White Hat. Robin Lamon, let's come to you first. Um, as a boy, I mean, you were forced to flee apartheid South Africa and you came to Altham in London. As it happens, the same borough where we saw that shocking racist attack and murder of Stephen Lawrence in 1993. Mm. You had a successful career at Hackney Community College and you set up, of course, the Network for Black Professionals. Despite some progress of black leadership positions in FE in the last decade after the McPherson report, you recently said in an open letter to the sector, written by you and colleagues in the newly formed Black FE Leadership Group, that FE had not only gone 
gone backwards in recent years, but, and I quote, that too many BAME students and staff have for too long encountered a hostile environment and a system that places a knee on our neck. A reference, I think, there to the events over the summer and the death of George Floyd. Tell us more about what was meant by that phrase, a system that places a knee on our neck. Well, Tom, the, 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 there are some facts that uh, make us believe that. One is that the percentage of black and minority ethnic students in FE has been going up steadily. It's always double the ratio in the population. And uh, so it's around about 30 percent now. Uh, yeah. And yet, if you look at the outcomes for those students, uh, they are not improving at all. Certainly for some minority ethnic groups, they're declining. Um, and, and in terms of uh, basic things like staffing representation, yeah. uh, that's gone down as well. So so there, there is an issue about how FE has responded to the its self-proclaimed moniker of being a social justice sector. You know, the fact that it's not even noticed this decline until very recently and hasn't done anything positive to address it. And yet at the same time, every organisation ever has a very squeaky clean EDI uh, structure in which they claim to be committed to, to equality at all levels. Yeah, as you say, certainly you know, the data supports this. There's uh, yeah. there has been a decline in the number of uh, black principals uh, in FE colleges in recent years. Um, you know, the Education Training Foundation has found that actually less than 3% of senior staff are from a black and minority ethnic background. So yeah. I, I guess, you know, in the sense the, you know, the knee on the neck bit is really a, you know, a sort of metaphor for downward, yeah. downward pressure on uh, diversity. Yeah. Kevin Robinson, let's turn uh, for your thoughts on this subject. I mean, after the events of the summer, you said that Black Lives Matter and critical race theory had no place in education. Why shouldn't students and staff in FE not have to confront difficult questions and challenges about the state of race relations and indeed institutional racism in Britain today? Oh, so much to pick apart from that question. <laughs> I'm not saying that uh, this conversation shouldn't be had. I'm saying that we shouldn't be teaching um, things like critical race theory, you know, the idea that white people are privileged and black people are oppressed um, as uncontestable facts. That's what I'm talking about there. Um, yeah. I think there is a conversation to be had about whether FE and education in general is about imparting knowledge or if it's about social justice. I'm not saying it's a zero-sum game. It could be about both. But we have to be clear about what we're trying to do here and what our aims are in education. Are we, you know, are we trying to uh, uh, create a, a generation of young people with a lot of knowledge or are we trying to fix societal issues? And I don't think schools and colleges can be expected to, to fix all of the issues that we have in society. Sure, um, but, yeah. but do you, you recognise, though, something that um, Robin identified there about the fact that you know there's a disjunct, isn't there, between between a sector like further education, which generally speaking does practice the values or certainly speaks the values of uh, social justice, uh, of equality, not just before the law, but equality between people. But then actually when you go beneath the surface and you look at the representation, you know, the actual, you, know, you hold a mirror to the sector, to education, particularly to FE, mm. you don't see modern Britain reflected, do you? In those, is representation uh, a sign of equality? I don't think it is. I think I talk well, about equality me. of opportunity as, the, you know, I, I I uh, quite rapidly became a school leader as a yeah. black and minority ethnic person myself. I didn't experience any hurdles or any barriers to do to be, get where I wanted to get. And when we talk about representation, we make the assumption that it's difficult or there are extra barriers in place for people of color to get into influential positions. We also have, have to consider that this is a choice. And you know, not every black teacher wants to become a head teacher. Not every uh, black um, person in industry wants to become a governor or a trustee of a college or school. So I don't think representation is what we need to look at we don't need to look at the outcomes we need to look at the opportunities and make sure everyone has an equal chance to okay. do whatever they want to do okay let's bring Shola on that because uh, you know there was a lot in that as well and i'm sure um uh, both robin and Shola have uh, views on that but uh Shola west you're a successful young black woman unlike your peers you left college and sought out an apprenticeship where you've done incredibly yeah. well i mean there's no doubt when you look at the data uh you know the barriers to apprenticeships that young people women and ethnic minorities face that there are some you know real questions to answer what do you say then mm -hmm. and i think it's sort of part reflected in what calvin was saying there what do you say though to people who would look at your experience and say well there can't really be a problem in black minority ethnic representation in areas like apprenticeships and the professions because you've made it for the, uh, through yeah that's a really good point i think personally the way i see it is apprenticeships are more of a route to actually getting diversity and giving
giving people from different yeah. backgrounds a chance to actually thrive at work and have that progression that they might not have had elsewhere. I think I could speak from my personal experiences. Uni wasn't really an option for me, mainly because my grades weren't the best, meaning that if I was to go to uni, it wouldn't have been the best one anyway. And also things to like, you know, the money and stuff like that. So for me, it wasn't even an option that I considered. So I then looked around for other things. I found apprenticeships and it was a great experience for me because it actually allowed me to use my strengths and that was good enough. So for example, whilst other people may have, you know, A-stars at, at A-levels, I actually didn't do A-levels, but I was working in retail. And I was only working at Five Guys, but actually when I went to apply for apprenticeship, that was seen as great because it showed that I had intent, it showed that I had drive, ambition, I could wake up in the morning. And that's how I actually got my apprenticeship. So it's it's a great way to bring in diversity because the sort of um, barriers for university is it's completely different. So it actually opens up a widespread of ways for alternative talent and alternative ways to progress for young people to come in. So what we need to try and kind of unpick here then is is the fact that i mean there's no doubt when you look at the data um black and minority ethnic people are underrepresented uh, actually in probably all sections of the fe uh, community but in particular at sort of middle and senior management level there's no doubt because again the data supports this that they're underrepresented in some aspects of the um, apprenticeship and skills system although often that is also a reflector uh, of other inequalities in the labour market for example you know you see less women in engineering for example you see less working class boys uh, white working class boys for example uh, in some of those higher technical qualifications not least because they haven't got the prior attainment when they left the secondary school system for example so it's very kind of complex when you start to unpick some of the um, underlying inequalities but I mean I was struck by something Calvin said about in a sense you know is this also a system of choice you know are there enough uh, black role models are there enough people wanting to uh, aim for the top of uh, college institutions or training providers I mean Robin what's your perspective on that because I do think there's you know, there's quite a difference between the two of you in terms of how you're coming at that challenge. Yeah, I mean, I, I, no, that, that's uh, not unusual to, to have people diametric of diametrically sure, opposed yeah. to views uh, engaged in debate. Uh, I, I don't think I ever agree with Calvin's uh, viewpoint that, that the UK is a meritocracy with no flaws. And I'm also a bit surprised at his contention that, that uh, education and training shouldn't be about social justice. And the, the fundamental thing about education and training is that it's the basis on which your future is founded. It's no coincidence that the two last prime ministers in this country both went to Eton. Yeah, well, look, I mean, there it's no... Absolutely, yeah, yes. yeah, I mean, it's no secret, is it, that actually when yeah. you look uh, across 100 years of British governance, whether it's at the around the cabinet table, a small group of uh, universities, schools, many of them public schools, dominate those top professions. It's the same in the courts, it's the same in the military. I mean, that's as much a feature of, as anything, is it not, of Britain's social class structure as well so there's sort of race interjecting with class and here we are you know um in the second decade of the 21st century where even the government's own social mobility commission indeed that's what it's called says that at best we've stalled in relation to social mobility and in particular areas of the country we're going backwards not just in relation um to race uh, and inequality but of course across the piece in terms of broader socio-economic inequality calvin do you do you recognize what robin's saying there that you know this sort of idea idea that we are a 21st century meritocracy is bunkum isn't it not at all i I think i completely disagree with everything that robin just said um from from the underrepresentation as i don't see representation as an issue uh, to the social injustices uh, being clear you know you mentioned we we should look at the data um people of color have far more likely to go to university than uh, white british kids at the moment so there's these social injustices aren't clear and i'm not sure that it is all about race i think you're more on where where is that where is that information sorry robin now that you talk so i appreciate you where where did you get that information from that's from that's from the ons and from the the uh, DFE, it's all publicly available. Um, you can look up Bangladeshi, Pakistani, black African children are all, I think, twice as likely to go to university than the white British kids at the moment. Um, okay, and up, Calvin. do look it up. But I mean, they do Thank well. They, they excel all the way throughout school up to uh, up to college age. So that is a very well known fact. But the point that I'm making is that I think you are far more on the money when you said that actually these uh, these social injustices are not are not clear. And I think representation isn't an issue because we live, we still do 
live in a majority white country, so we're not going to see people who look like us everywhere. That isn't racism. That isn't a sign of institutional racism or systemic racism. That is just the state of things. And I think if you need to, to suggest that a black kid needs a black teacher, I think that is implicit racism. I think what we need is good teachers, good shooters, Calvin, good lecturers. Really, you really must, need to. You yeah. need I'd to rather you let me just from keep yeah. interrupting. All right. Me. Um, well, I'm the person I'm powering this discussion. So, Robin, I, I, just come back you. quickly um, on what Ga- um, Calvin said there. But I also want to bring Shola in, you know, because let's not just make this a three way uh, between the three blokes on the line. So, um, uh, Robin, just a quick response to, to what you heard from Calvin there. But I do want to bring Shola in on this as well. I just wanted to say, I think, in my opinion, it's quite unfair to say that um, there isn't enough like ethnic minorities who want to progress into high positions. Because for me personally, I've always wanted to progress and do well. But what I think is important here is that where I'm from, so Croydon, a lot of us were brought up knowing that there's only about maybe five careers that you could get into. And I, for example, I'm doing now I'm doing B2B marketing. I did a digital marketing qualification. But I actually didn't know about that in secondary school because I didn't go to the best school where we were, you know, able to travel around and go to university for open days and have all these people come in and teach us about all these cool careers like mm. software engineering. I didn't know about it. So you, I feel like it's kind of unfair to say that people don't aim high. What if they literally don't know? What if there's not enough opportunity, education, guidance, mentors? And I think that is so important. And because I managed to kind of just really, really push on, I moved, I removed myself from the situation. I went to a, a college in central London instead. That's only when I actually opened my eyes and found out about all these additional careers but back in school I had no idea so I think it isn't just the onus on the the young people to say oh well they don't want to get high positions anyway I think it's also ensuring that education and outreach is so important and that's something that White Hat really does well we have our apprentices go into schools from all sorts of areas and all sorts of postcodes and teach them about the sort of qualifications that you will be able to do and teaching them from a young age that if you get this sort of qualification if you go and get that retail experience you can get that but what the problem with the system I find is by 16 you kind of need to know what you want to do or you might be pushed back so for example if you've not done the right GCSE qualifications you've not done the right yeah. A-levels and then you want to turn around and say I want to do software engineering it's like oh you don't really have the right stuff whereas if the education is from the very beginning and people are actually having opportunity to know about these careers before the age of 16 then it actually allows you to get in yeah, so I think you sh- shouldn't say yeah. that it's on Absolutely. young yeah. people Shola what you're talking about there of course as well particularly around qualifications and exams is and again you know the academic empirical literature shows this there is a thing called unconscious bias that goes on in the education sector by the way that's just not uh, race relate- related that can be class related as well I mean you know one of the things about you know, the the case for exams going ahead next summer for all the imperfections of exams is that actually again what the research shows is that often if you rely purely on tutor predicted grades for example white working class boys will often be marked down compared to other uh, racial groups but look uh, you know I mean I think we've just got to draw a line under the fact that there's obviously disagreement around the extent to which FE in itself is a sort of, you know, institutionalised racist sector and this sort of broader view that, uh, you know, Calvin's bringing in, which is, no, it's more complicated than that. And actually, you know, we've got to look at, you know, the realities of what modern Britain looks like uh, today. You know what? I completely agree with what Shola was saying. She's absolutely right. right in that. We need to raise aspirations for all young people. We need to make sure we all have a great opportunity, a great chance to um, excel and succeed. That's, I'm, yeah. I'm not arguing with that. Okay. Can I just say, Tom, yeah. that uh, I'm very pleased for Calvin that he's had a, you know, an untroubled uh, life and he's never experienced racism. It's, it's, I did it's, not it's, say it's that. It's great to hear. It's great to hear. Don't twist my words. But I don't believe that's the case for uh, the majority of black people. And uh, the, the data confirms that. There is clear evidence that young people in, at school age uh, do perform highly. And obviously there are groups like Chinese and Indian uh, students who, who overperform uh, r- relatively. Uh, but the fact is that w- when they get to university, even the high-performing groups find it difficult to get into um, into Russell Group universities. They find it harder to get into blue chip companies yeah. for, for jobs. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, you know, you're uh, citing all the kind of you know the barriers that we know that stand in the way yeah. of people progressing. Robin, you know, would you accept that compared to 30, 40 years ago, is Britain a more progressive? Mer- Democratic society now than it was, for example, you know, when I was growing up in the West Midlands, you know, and I remember, for example, those of Bangladeshi descent, for example, coming into the school. And there's no doubt, you know, they were called all sorts of names, which I don't want to repeat on air, outright yeah. racist uh, stereotype names. Now, you know, I don't, in terms of my own kids don't come back from school and suggest they've heard that in the playground these days. Is Britain still on the path to being a more progressive a more equal society, or actually, to go back to your open letter, we're going backwards. If, you, if you'd asked me that before the uh, 
the Brexit debate, sure. then I would have agreed with you. But I think there has been a, a bit of, of poisoning of the atmosphere. Uh, right. And there has been an increase, a slight increase, I would say. It's certainly not uh, the Britain that I grew up in uh, when you were uh, shouted at in the street. And, and uh, you know, yeah, when, it's not like when that I was, today, you mean? Yeah. When I was, yeah. I was more afraid of the police than I was of, of skinheads at the time. Sure. The issue yeah. now has been um, made more acute right. by the, uh, the the issue of the, 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 the Brexit debate. I'm not... Okay. I'm, I, don't right. have I don't want to get into a whole sort of debate about racism. And, new... Yeah, yeah. I mean, let, let's that... sort of focus on the FE sector and, okay. and okay. the FE workforce. And, and look, you know, I've only got a couple of minutes. I mean, you may be aware that recently BBC Director General, the new one, Tim Davey, uh, set a 50-50 gender split target. I think he's set one mm. uh, 20% for uh, black and minority ethnic uh, personnel and indeed 12% for disabled representatives. Presentation. I mean, that looks on the face of it like a, a white leader of a major institution. Ironically, I think a predecessor of Tim Davies, Greg Dyke, once described the mm. BBC as hideously white, I think was the phrase he used. Kevin, let, let, let's get your reaction first to this, because I know you've got your own views about the BBC. You know, Do you welcome that sort of leadership from the top, setting very clear, measurable goals about where that institution will be in the future in relation to black and minority ethnic representation? Firstly, I do have to come back on uh, people commenting on my own personal lived experience. I have experienced a lot of racism in my, in my life. I was right. the only black kid in my school. Um, but my point is that education is not institutionally racist just because racism still does exist and we still do need to stamp it out. And I don't think it's right to blame it on Brexit. But to bring it back to the question of the BBC, I think they're looking at superficial diversity and that's always the problem, especially in large institutions like this. They want more brown faces that think alike. Uh, it's a massive group think going on at the BBC. Right. There's very little uh, centre-right opinion. And I think we need to open that up and targets are not helpful because they undermine merits I would never want to get a job because of the colour of my skin. I want to get a job because I'm good at what I do. And I think targets and quotas undermine that value and bring in resentment from other people and embarrassment to, to, to the people that get the roles. Shola, what's your res- response to that in terms of the BBC, but also Calvin's view that you wouldn't want to feel that you were just getting a job? as a black person because there was a target in the organisation that said you had to have one. Yeah, I I actually agree with that statement. It can undermine the merit and can cause embarrassment, especially if people in the organisation feel confident enough to tell you, you know, you're you're kind of the, the, I don't know, the diversity (coughs) hire or the you only got this role because of this whatever. And that obviously can really make you feel embarrassed. But also I feel like it is good to have targets like it is with anything because how else do you measure success? Um, and how else do you see that people are putting in these pro- these processes in place? Um, so I think it's kind of a mixture of both. I'm not too sure on that. But I think one thing I want to mention is that diversity doesn't work without the inclusion. And I feel like a lot of the time people focus on diversity because how the yeah. makeup of the organisation looks and it's kind of like a tick box exercise. But again, if you're not making sure that those people then feel included within the workforce, then that's going to lead to bad retention because what will happen is people will come, they'll realise that they're the only kind of token black person or the token Asian person. Um, they're not being treated right or fairly. Even small things, I have an example of a friend I was speaking to the other day who said to me that for their Christmas celebration virtually they sent out hampers to everyone and the only option was red wine and cheese and um prosecco and chocolate and having things like that where you know even from a, right, yeah. a, a inclusion point of view for, for religion not everybody drinks yeah so if you're doing indeed. things that don't include everyone it's really not going to help so yeah. you have to have the diversity with inclusion. Really, so i just hope they're doing that as well yeah that's a really strong point in terms mm. of uh inclusion and diversity and indeed you know people even talk these days about cognitive diversity which i think is also a reference back to what calvin was saying there about Mm. the dangers of groupthink uh in many of our institutions um robin last word to you then um i mean if the association of colleges working with the black fe leadership group were to come out as part of a inclusion and diversity strategy to say right by 2030 uh we're going to have 20 percent of principals uh who are black and minority ethnic presumably you'd welcome that uh um, obviously uh, targets are a good thing Thing if they had handled properly, uh, you know, one of the things is that there's a big difference between a target and a quota, uh, and nobody is interested in people being appointed because of the colour of their skin. I, I don't think our organisation or any accreditable organisation would ever argue that. So there are still requirements for the job which have to be met. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the history of targets is a fairly checkered one, isn't it? There have been organisations like the Met, like the BBC or FE and so on, that have set targets and constantly failed to achieve them. Uh, it's, yeah. it's much more complex than, than setting an arbitrary target and saying we're going to do this. Uh, it's it's more about recognising 
the need to reflect modern Britain. Uh, and that doesn't mean people get the job because of their, their skin colour. It means that people with the qualifications and the, and the aptitude and, and the drive are, are considered on their merits. It's as simple as that. You're listening to the Skills World Live radio show with Tom Buick.
live tonight or live and die this way. Day Partners works across the UK education and skills sector to transform leadership and inspire societal change. We do this through executive search, recruitment and board development services. If your organisation requires support to appoint great leaders through a thorough and national search campaign, or perhaps your board has a skills gap which needs filling, contact Perido for an informal discussion about how we can help you. We love what we do, and we do it with passion. So search online for Perido Partners or email education at peridopartners.co.uk. For the ad break there, you heard Tracy Chapman on that wonderful acoustic chart topper, Fast Car from 1988. And the previous segment, just want to thank, of course, Robin Lamman, Shola West, and Calvin Robinson. What was a very interesting and engaging debate. Now, in our second discussion of the evening on the state of diversity in further education, I caught up earlier with three gentlemen who have got quite a lot of experience in this area. Frank Douglas is the CEO at the recruitment specialist firm Cyrus Executive and also a trustee of the City and Guilds Group. Safras Ali is the co-founder and CEO of the Pathway Group and uh, will be known to many of you actually as the founder of the BAME Apprenticeship Awards. Finally, David Russell, Chief Exec of the Education and Training Foundation, also joined us. But I started my discussion looking back, rather philosophically, at Martin Luther King's iconic I Have a Dream speech, given on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in August 1963, when King led the march on Washington for jobs and freedom. I asked Frank Douglas, who was born in America, why, over half a century later, we are still having a debate about civil rights for black and minority ethnic people on both sides of the pond. You can listen in now to what both Frank and the rest of my guests in that segment told me. Thanks, Tom, and thanks for asking me an impossible question to kick off the... Um, it's very <laughs> the, macro, isn't it? You know, <laughs> to, to, to answer. Um, you know, I'm sure there's scholars who could fill books on, 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 on the answer to that question. My personal viewpoint is that I think we've been looking at a lot of false positives in the U.S. in particular. I think the election of Obama, you know, the sense that we were in a post-racial era, I think that created false expectations. Incomes are still rising slower for, for black Americans than white Americans. There's structural racism that took place in America that hasn't really um, been able to close the cap. So in the housing market, you know, a lot of the gap between white wealth in the U.S. and black wealth in the U.S., if you wish, is related to the worth of their homes. And in the yeah. UK, you know, in, there is still a bias in society. Um, a, a, a white youth getting a 2-2 in a university will still end up on average with a better paying job than a black youth getting a 2-1 in a Russell Group university. Really haven't made the strong enough interventions to compensate for the historical um, yeah. discrimination that's taken place. And on that point, of course, President Obama famously talked about progress, didn't he, in terms of the long arc of history? And he's made that point that progress doesn't necessarily continue in a straight line. And I think what you've touched on there in relation to inequality on both sides of the Atlantic, racial inequality is, whilst, you know, going back to 1963 and that famous speech on the Lincoln Memorial, perhaps we'll come back to that in relation more to then the FE sector shortly. But let's move on to Safras. Um, Let's come to you next. I mean, you're a senior leader, aren't you, within the learning and skills sector, not least as a chief executive of Pathways of Training Provider. I mean, you'll be aware, Safras, that the data on minority ethnic leaders in FE shows, frankly, we've gone backwards in recent years in terms of uh, senior appointments on boards, college principal level. Um, I mean, even significant bodies, regulators, statutory bodies, dare I say, you know, awarding organisations as well. What do you put that down to? Why, having perhaps had a period of some progress after the McPherson report in 2002, there was the Foster review in 2005, there was an initiative then actually around trying to improve diversity and inclusion. What's happened in particular in the last few years, do you think? 
Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, I think uh, race in the workplace generally has been an issue for decades. And uh, in terms of specifically with, with us, in terms of our sector, it's it's more the important, particularly with regard to the impact that we have uh, in terms of education and training. We're obviously in big influences in, on young people. And, and when you look at the demographics in certain areas, there's a, there's a majority uh, of BAME young people. So I think it's more and more important the fact that we have the right representation at the right level. When I'm seeing is uh, in terms of uh, schools particularly there, there there seems to be in, in particular obviously you know from well, I'm from Birmingham area but the, the, in, in, in schools there's there seems to be uh, a good level of representation and you can see it but it's at the senior level where the, where, where probably are what the issues are in terms of would you be able to um, identify identify say BAME leaders in the FE sector or BAME leaders in the awarding body or independent training providers and there's there's there's, there's not many names that you would be able no, to No I mean you could probably count those names couldn't you on two two hands if you're lucky yeah uh, at the moment so that, that, that's where the where where the underrepresentation is david you set up and run a foundation that receives money obviously from the government to raise quality standards and leadership across the fe sector uh you wrote a blog on uh, diversity on the etf um, web website i think actually one of the figures you yourself highlighted was that there was 2.5 percent estimated were from a black or african caribbean descent these in terms of senior managers within the fe sector what do you put that low level of representation down to then um well i think it's a complex issue complex set of issues um and i think frank and sapphires have touched on some of the big answers already so, you know to pick up frank's theme things take a long time you know when there's when there's historical injustice when there's structural bias you know that is very powerful you need not only targeted but sustained and sustainable action uh, to overturn that and sadly nothing has been particularly sustained or sustainable in the FE sector uh, for quite some time now because when the backdrop is austerity and uh, extreme financial challenge and, and you know that's just a fact all sorts of people in all kinds of positions have, have accepted underfunding of FE as a fact that set the backdrop for everything else um, it makes it less attractive as career proposition for for talented people uh, it increases uh, stress and strain at all levels and it also act on governing bodies to make them risk averse and speaking to black and asian colleagues in the sector about their their experiences and their views one of the things that um, they tell me time and time again is uh, i can get quite far but when push comes to shove it's a very unusual governing body that's going to take a risk on someone who looks Looks like me, someone who looks and sounds like me, because they haven't done it before, and now is not the time they think to take risks. So I think all of these things interact in quite a powerful way. In yeah. terms of solutions, <laughs> Safraz's point about recruitment, development, and retention. You know, we need a yeah. sustained program that does recruitment, development, and retention, not a one-off thing that that will kind of support a cadre for a short period of time and it's not sustainable. It needs to be, uh, you know, big, ambitious long-term program. Frank, what's your perspective on that? I mean, you are a HR executive and, you know, you've had your own challenges of workforce diversity, working for the FTSE 100. Now you advise all sorts of companies around inclusion and diversity strategies. What is the answer to that board that is, for whatever reason, reticent about promoting black leadership within their organisation, bringing them through the ranks and around the boardroom table? Yeah, as Fruity said, it's not it's not an easy issue. Um, here's the here's why it's really a big dilemma is that if you take the gold standard in the consulting world of McKinsey, but you know there's yeah. probably studies from Harvard and Boston Consulting Group, but if we just quote McKinsey, McKinsey says that um, for those companies that excel in the top quartile of gender and ethnic diversity, they are 35% more likely to outperform their competitors. 35% more likely to outperform their competitors. There is probably no other lever right now sitting on a CEO's desk that will get them that sort of opportunity to outperform than having an inclusive culture. Yet, they don't do it. And the question I always wrestle with is, why don't they believe the data? Because they believe just about everything, you know, McKinsey says. And McKinsey says in 2002, there's a war for talent. Everyone shifts left and says, let's go out there and change our value propositions, et cetera. So why they don't believe it? They don't believe that diversity and inclusion is truly a value driver. You know, it's kind of a nice thing yeah. to do and maybe the Parker Review and, you know, the, the FCA is doing it, but they really haven't captured the, the reality that it's a value driver. Having said that, that's a UK perspective. 
Yeah, in right. the U.S., you will find that it's not unusual to have a chief diversity officer who reports directly into the CEO in the U.S. And because of the corporate governance structure in the U.S., the CEO many times is also the chairperson of the. So in the U.S., you have the chief diversity officer sitting on the executive committee reporting to the CEO, chairperson of the board. Other than ITV two months ago, ITV is the only FTSE 100 company that has a chief diversity officer reporting into Carol and McCall. And that was only two months ago. Is it time? Because we, you know, we can have this sort of debate about perceptions. We can say, well, actually, we, you know, just look at the figures, the low percentages. There's clearly a huge representation crisis of black and minority ethnic leaders, middle managers, those coming through the system across the whole of the FE system. This isn't about targeting one particular part of the sector. Is it time, do you think, for quotas or positive discrimination to be formally implemented in the sector? And would you support that if it were muted? Um, Safras, let's start with you. I haven't heard from you for a while. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tom. I think as as uh, both uh, colleagues, Frank and David, said earlier on, it's not a simple thing. It's not an easy thing. It's been, you know, we've been talking about it for a long time. Um, and, you know, you talk about courage, but generally people are risk averse. They're frightened to take decisions, to uh, take big, uh, big decisions. And people, even if it's facing right in front of them, even if there's there's facts out there, there is a there. You know, we 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 go on emotion, and whether it's unconscious bias training or anything else, you know, we you know it's about hearts and minds, and it's about people make decisions mainly on emotion, gut instinct, and I think the awareness is there. People are aware of the issue, but in some cases, people think that it's not a their issue or, you know, it's it's somebody else's issue. It's about inspiring also talent at a level where, you know, this talent speaks for itself. It's also allowing people the how-to and maintaining that. It's about the consistency of it. You know, we are living in an environment where things have slowed down a little bit, and that's, you know, the macro world picture. But, you know, we, we need to get away from the, the things that are emotive, the fact that this is, you know, people raise this raise this issue, issue if they're troublemakers or, you know, if they're, you know, if they're there to cause uh, an issue. And yeah. it's really seeing it as a positive thing, not as a fair thing. I, I think the fact is that we do have positive discrimination, not not in, in the way you framed it, Tom, because when, when, when 20 of your prime ministers have attended Eton, when seven <laughs> have attended Harrow, <laughs> and six at Westminster, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and then you have Cameron, Osborne, and um, Boris both having gone to Clarendon schools. When you have approximately seventy-one percent, I think, of senior judges, sixty-two percent of the senior armed forces, fifty-five percent of Whitehall permanent secretaries, and fifty percent of the members of the House of um, Lords been privately educated, we already have positive discrimination. So, so, so maybe we need to turn the the triangle upside down and say we need to actually have negative discrimination um, to actually you know, um, level the playing field. You're listening to the Skills World Live radio show with Tom Buick. That phrase, level playing field, has been used a few times, uh, come up a few times this week, hasn't it? Now, moving on to our final segment of the show, as we look at the issue of diversity in FE and how we might seek to solve some of the challenges laid out by our earlier guest. Guest Kirsty Lord is the Deputy Chief Executive of the Association of Colleges and she joins me live on the line now. Good evening, Kirsty. Hello, Tom. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on and helping us to close out um, this particular debate uh, this evening. And I believe you've had a uh, chance, haven't you, to listen to, to some of it this evening? Yeah, and I think it's been it's been a really um, interesting discussion, and I think there have been yeah. some really good challenges put forward as well. Absolutely. On that point, though, that Robin Lamman raised about uh, black and minority ethnic students, with with some exceptions, not achieving as well as their white peers in FE colleges, how um, how do you explain that? I think we have to. Uh, uh, understand that within the context that actually there are some groups that routinely outperform white students in yeah. colleges. So African, Indian, Pakistani and Bangladeshi students routinely annually outperform white students and not just by, you know, a small proportion, but by two and three percent in some cases in terms of overall achievement. And that's across 16 to 18 and 19 plus. But there are some really significant um, gaps that have been long-standing um, that sit with particular groups. So, for example, Caribbean students 
Um, but also, mm. I would say across all mixed heritage students, I don't think there's a single group in terms of mixed heritage students where they are performing better than white students or as well as. Um, and, and, you know, although small, small numbers, as, uh, in, comparatively, uh, Gypsy Traveller um, students and um, Irish students actually perform really quite badly compa compared to nearly all other ethnic groups. So there are some huge challenges. And I think um, what's difficult with the data that we get is that it's, it's very um flat linear data and actually yeah. in order to understand the issues that sit behind this you need to start looking at the intersectionality that there is behind this as well yeah, absolutely um and and considering and you know looking at sort of gcse data actually when you look at the proportion of young people um who are eligible for free school meals um across all ethnic groups compared to those who are not eligible for free school meals, there's an enormous disparity in terms of that when we're talking about socioeconomic deprivation as well. And so the, the question for me is, how is that compounded in terms of ethnicity and socioeconomic deprivation? And how do we how do we drill down into that and understand that? And also, yeah. in you know, there are some issues in terms of gender that, 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 that sit Absolutely. behind this as well. You know, that, that actually, and, and until you start to put all of those pieces together, it's really hard to get underneath the reason, the exact reasons why there are issues. And I think the one big thing that I would say is it will vary from college to college how students yeah. are performing by ethnicity, by gender, by those 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 um, you know intersectionalities that they can actually track and, and 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 put together as part of their data set to help them understand what the issues are and tackle them. Um, you know, in terms of an achievement gap basis, um, rather than so the national data set, it, it, t it tells a story and it's a stark story, yeah. but it's not very helpful in terms of looking at solutions. So is the data sets we're all using, and you probably heard in the previous discussion, lots of facts and stats, uh, some of them contested, you know, have been thrown around. As it happens, actually, I looked up the issue um, that was raised, you know, with Calvin Robinson's point about whether or not um, ethnic minorities were generally more likely to get access to university these days than their white British peers. I think it was actually based on an Institute of Fiscal Studies um, report in 2015, which indeed did find that. Or as you say, when you get more into though, the complexities, whether it's gender, whether it's racial groups, uh, whether it's uh, non-white British, I, for example, uh, Irish uh, traveller uh, would come into that category. Indeed, I think you alluded to this. The um, you know the really shocking stats now you're seeing uh, uh, with white working class boys who are on free school meals compared to even their fellow uh, white British peers who aren't on free school meals and then of course other ethnic groups so it is as you say a very very um, complex multi-dimensional picture but is the data that we're all using is it fit for purpose? Yeah. Um, on an, on a, it's challenging isn't it on a national scale uh, it probably gives some very crude benchmarking I think it, you know when you think about colleges internal capacity and ability to cut data however they, they want and need to yeah. There is accessibility to that. And actually, there's accessibility to benchmarking within that intersectionality as well. Yeah. So you can access it. But how, in terms of how it's articulated nationally, it's it's a blunt tool. And, yeah. you know, I think we could say that of, of any data set. And just to say, you know, I'm looking at the, the GCSE um, results by free school meals and no free school meals in 2017-18. And in terms of white students, there is the biggest gap between those who, who are more socially economic disadvantaged than those yeah. who aren't yeah. compared to any other ethnicity it's, it's 16 percent different yeah. I mean, in terms of achievement yeah. and that's extraordinary on the representation point because that's obviously come up a lot uh, this evening um, one of the things that really strikes me about the figures is that at a student population level, you see obviously quite significant what you might call overrepresentation of black students uh, in FE, particularly compared to you know the average uh, in the population as a whole. Yet conversely, you see really significant underrepresentation of black staff at senior management levels in our FE colleges. Indeed, I think less than three percent of college senior staff are from a um, black and minority ethnic background, compared to around eighteen percent in the population as a whole. Why are fewer black principals today? Uh, being appointed than they were a decade ago? 
I think uh, when you look at the landscape a decade ago, and I, and I think I'm going to probably be pulling in some of David Russell's points around, um, you know, we, we've had yeah, a decade of, of austerity. But when you look at the landscape a decade ago, two things were happening in conjunction with each other. The first was there was investment in terms of the support and career development of black leaders within the sector. That, that And that, that was, you know, sort of... Um, supported by ELSIS and came in the form of Black Leadership Initiative, Black Leadership Network. Um, and, you know, you look at some of the longitudinal studies that were done of, of those initiatives and you can see the increase that there was in, in Black chief execs, particularly in principals. Yeah. Um, and, and that came to a peak in 2015. That work stopped in 2012. The funding was 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 removed in 2012. And you see sort of a peak of a proportion of um, black and minority ethnic principals and chief execs at about 13% in 2015. And since then, it has tailed off almost year on year. Yeah. We, we reckon in terms of chief execs and principals, it's probably around 6%. But actually, when you get to second tier, the number, go, the, the proportion goes down. Um, and so actually, in terms of what, what we're building sectorally in terms of succession planning, there's a massive challenge there because because there are fewer um, second tier leaders from black and minority ethnic backgrounds than there are currently leaders. So yeah. where do our where where do our and, and I, I actually you know agree with Robin on the point that it, in terms of representation that isn't about tokenism for me. That yeah. is about providing positive role models for your staff for your students about what what achievement can look like and that goes across your governing body as well as your senior leadership yeah. team yeah. but it's also about understanding and lived experience and you know i was um in a conversation with an academic recently about governance you know that these things happen um and he was talking about you know cognitive dissonance from the point of view of but if you've got two intellectually different positions yeah. a wise conversation can actually be more productive than 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 a representative group speaking about things yeah. and my response very politely was where and where do you get the wisdom around what it's like to live in a, you know in a tower block in b19 yeah. You know that that has to be from somebody who's lived that experience and understands it. So yeah. I think I yeah, well, think, that was the group know, think point. I think also that Calvin was making. Yeah. You know, like I say, you can have um, different coloured faces around a boardroom table, but if they're all broadly from the same socioeconomic background and share the same worldview, then you're not really say going to get that cognitive dissonance uh, into the conversation um are you uh, i wanted just to uh, look at the the work now the black uh, fe leadership group um they obviously established themselves over the summer they published a a 10 point plan and wrote an open letter to the sector i mean just to give our listeners um a clear idea of what sort of measures uh, the group are looking for for action on from college leaders i mean it includes reform to the college curriculum better data returns and monitoring reports published by colleges uh, annually and um, big changes of course to college recruitment processes that point we just made there and also David Russell made about a really sustainable substantial recruitment development and retention program for black leaders does the AOC support that 10 point plan I think we we absolutely recognize and agree that you know that the 10 point plan has a re really highlights um, the lack of focus that there has been on EDI through scrutiny method methodology within the sector and the lack of investment that there has been. And so from absolutely from that perspective, we would agree that, that you know, the profile needs raising and the focus needs raising. And that that has to be through a number of different levers and mechanisms. It has to be through colleges actually holding themselves more accountable. Yeah. Um, and thinking about, you know, um, every college will be meeting its statutory duty in terms of equality, diversity and inclusion from a board level in terms of oversight and scrutiny. But what else? You know, how, yeah. how are you succession planning for your board? How are you succession planning for your senior leadership team? How are you actually recruiting the pipeline that are going to be your senior leadership team in 10, 15 years time? How is that process yeah. being done? Um but I think also in terms of the ex external eye and supporting colleges and holding themselves to account on that, because ultimately what we don't want is for um, equality, diversity and inclusion to be something that you tick off a list. Yeah, it absolutely, absolutely not. can't be that. So, yeah. It has to sit through the, through the heart of an organisation. I think a significant part of that is really considering organisationally and from a leadership point yeah. of view and from a governance point of view, okay. how inclusive you are. Yeah. Because what you don't want to be in a situation but, is is where that you do recruit somebody from the, from a diverse background onto your board, and they don't stay long because they don't feel they can make a, a substantive contribution. Absolutely. And, you know, 
but as you say, it comes down in the end, doesn't it, to to actions, not sort of words. I mean, uh, um, Robin talked about these squeaky clean EDI statements that all FE colleges uh, will have a, uh, as part of their corporate documentation. I mean, would the AOC support something uh, like what the uh, Director General of the BBC has announced this week, you know, a target by 2030 for 20% of black and minority ethnic personnel working in our FE colleges, 50-50 women and men, 12% disabled employees. I mean, is that is that where we've arrived at in terms of being able to really measure the progress going forward? Or would you propose something different to that? I I think numbers are quite arbitrary. Yeah. Uh, I think I think we have an issue with within the sector at the moment around FE being an attractive career proposition for anyone. <laughs> Um, and that needs some some really significant thought. I I think uh, the other th- the other issue that we have got, and the, the, you know, in terms of the ten point plan, I completely agree. In, in terms of how data is collected and returned upon, you know, there are some assumptions in in what we're, what we're talking about, but we're not routinely collecting data on senior leaders. You know, we at AOC we do the senior leadership pay survey. Um, yeah. We offer the incentive of benchmarking with that. We get about a 63, 64 percent return from the sector. Right. That, and so, in terms of the mandatory data, workforce data return that the Department of Education are going to implement as of um, July this year, we'd really look, like to see, for example, governors included in that because yeah. at the moment we haven't got a, an holistic data set that gives us the entire picture. Okay. I think it's really hard to set targets when you don't know what your starting point is. Indeed, there's no um, point setting targets, think- is there? If we're going to miss the point of what inclusion and diversity is about. Uh, alas, Kirsty Lord, um, the time Lord is, is in fact against us. We've run out of time. <laughs> um, but Kirsty Lord, uh, Deputy Chief Executive at the Association of Colleges, really appreciate you coming on Skills of Wide this, uh, Live this evening and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You're listening to the Skills World Live radio show with Tom Buick. When I was at school all those years ago, I still have some vivid memories of going to see Prince star in his own film, Purple Rain. From that album of the same title is this wonderful pop synth track, When Doves Cry. Thanks as ever to all tonight's guests and the production crew, Gavin O'Mara and Ellie Hansen. Don't forget to tune in next week, folks, for the season finale as we look ahead to the new year and continue connecting the world of FE. Goodbye.
Remember to subscribe to Skills World Live at fenews.co.uk or just download the show from any one of your favourite podcasting sites, including iTunes, Spotify and Spreaker. Your world, Skills World.